we're back on the record on case number 2210869DM. Um, Ms. Whitman, do you have any further witnesses? We do not, Your Honor. We rest. Thank you. Ms. Belden? Yes, Your Honor. We'd like to call um, the plaintiff, Andrew, Hamil or H Andrew Hamilton Llewellyn, to the stand. Thank you. Sir, if you'd raise your right hand, please. Do you swear from the testimony you're about to give the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Great. Um, Andrew, you've been sitting through this for a few days now. Um, you can confirm that Ishwari is your wife or your soon-to-be ex-wife, correct? Yes, I can. And the two of you share three children together, correct? Yes, I do. And those, yes. three, those three children are all minors at this point in time? Yes. Okay. Um, do you mind going through with the court what your academic background is? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I sort of academic and personal background going back to high school or how far back would you like me to go? Yes, I would. That, that in furtherance of your career, I'd start probably with college. College. Well, uh, I grew up in Ann Arbor. I went to Pioneer High School. I started college at Wake Forest University in North Carolina. Uh, I was a recruited walk on on the soccer team. Um, we were a top 10 soccer team program. Uh, it was a bit much for me, so I transferred to the College of Worcester, where a lot of my family had gone. I had a scholarship there, sort of an overall academic kind of athletic scholarship. I majored in English, um, captain the soccer team. We were ranked second in the country. I met Aishwari at Worcester. Um, and then Aishwari and I lived in England for a while. We lived in New York. I, and I coached soccer in New York. I lived in Ann Arbor and I coached soccer in Ann Arbor and applied to go to graduate school to get a master's in fine arts and creative writing. Um, in August of 2005, I began an MFA program at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale, Illinois, which is a regional university in Southern Illinois. I had a TA position and all my tuition was paid, so I had a stipend. Um, it was a three-year program um, in I was doing very well in March of 2007. I swear, I, I swear and I had broken up, but she told me she was pregnant and we decided to get married. And she was um, doing a pre-med program at Loyola, Loyola University in Chicago. And I had completed all my coursework at SIU. I just need to finish my thesis. So I decided to move to Chicago and get a job and finish my thesis. We got married. Joseph was born in October of 2007. And um, I got a job in digital content uh, with a company that made e-learning courses. In the June of 2008, I swear I found out she was pregnant again. Um, the recession hit, hit us pretty hard. I think I was making like $2,100 a month. I couldn't really support our family. In February of 2009, I left my full-time position to start freelancing because um, I could make more money, could make like $50 an hour. Um, had a hard time and then eventually I got a freelance position with an advertising agency doing something called content strategy which sort of the burgeoning field working with digital content with like website redesigns. Um, freelance, I got a full-time position in March of 2010. My previous job had been $35,000 a year and this was about 11 months later and my salary was $80,000 a year. So I made a salary increase of like 105% in about a year. Um, we wanted to move out of Chicago and about a year after that, a agency, advertising agency that had offices in Brooklyn and Los Angeles contacted me, um, and offered me a job. We wanted to move. We got kind of focused on Los Angeles, on California. We looked all over the country, North Carolina and Maine and Ann Arbor and Minneapolis, and we kind of focused on California. Um, I remember New Year's Eve of 2010, we did vision boards and I swear you drew this vision of a Cadillac Escalade riding through the streets of Los Angeles with palm trees. Uh, and we went in March of 2011, I presented a panel at South by Southwest Interactive in Austin. And she and I went down there and it was like 72 degrees and sunny and wonderful. And we went back to Chicago and it was 
dreary and miserable and we were like, we're done with this. If I get that job, we're moving. And I got the job and we moved to Los Angeles in April of 2011. Um, that job did not go well, was not a good fit. I got laid off uh, about a year. Yeah, I got laid off in May of 2012. Um, and pretty much immediately started working freelance, doing kind of two things. I was doing freelance copywriting. I was doing freelance content strategy. Earlier, like in March or February, there was a, I was starting sports writing too. So I'd gotten my degree, I'd written a, was trying to finish a novel. And um, I went to just a reading of a, a website called Grantland that was owned by ESPN. Um, I went to a reading they were doing at a bookstore in Los Angeles. I recognized an editor, introduced myself, pitched him a story, and eventually he picked that up as like a five-part series, and that kind of launched um, my work as in sports journalism, which I had no training in. So I wrote for like Grantland and New York Times. Um, I uh, and was still doing copywriting and content strategy. I remember I went to a writing workshop in January of 2013 and met an editor of the LA Weekly, which is a weekly, and an editor of Playboy magazine. Um, sold an article to LA Weekly. I sold a feature story to Playboy, which I wrote and then they eventually killed. Um, and sort of continued doing like content strategy, copywriting, sports writing, wrote a feature for ESPN, the magazine, um, and would kind of continue to do that. The last, the last story that I, the last piece of sports writing I did was for ESPN, the magazine, it was in 2015. They sent me to Paris to profile a uh, female soccer player who was German, but she was like a Kosovo refugee and she was Muslim and there'd just been a, a, uh, terrorist attack. It wasn't the big one in November. It was at the Charlie Hebdo newspaper because she had been there. Paris sent me, or ESPN sent me there to Paris to profile her. So I wrote that story. Um, and that was published. And then at, around that time, like I, you know, I didn't have much training in journalism and it was a kind of a grind. And so I decided to shift my uh, focus to um, screenwriting. I had a novel that I'd sent out that didn't get picked up. I had a nonfiction book that got rejected, but got me an agent. Um, I mean, I'd been on NPR and, you know, kind of national radio and stuff. Um, so in 2015, I started pursuing screenwriting. I did a program at UCLA. Uh, I worked one-on-one -on -one as a, with a teacher who actually I swear he had met through some work she'd been doing. <clears throat> I went to UCLA to do a certificate program at television writing. Um, in 2016, we had a contest at UCLA that I won. Um, that was, and then I got published in Deadline, which is like an industry trade publication. Um, so I had a bunch of, uh, production companies and agencies requested. <clears throat> I got close with one, everybody passed. Um, had another script that was out with some production companies that got passed on. I had another script that was out with some production companies that got passed on, kind of the way it goes. Like, um, and then continued to kind of do content strategy, copywriting. I worked at the NFL for a while uh, in their media department. Um, and then had a podcast I created that almost was sold to Stitcher and Westwood One and Spotify. That got passed on. Um, had another nonfiction book proposal I got passed on. Um, and so it's kind of always been like a combination of those things, copywriting, content strategy, um, screenwriting, sports writing. And uh, that's sort of what I continue to do to this day. Okay. And you have historically been the primary breadwinner for your family, correct? Correct. Quite honestly, you've always been the breadwinner for your family, correct? Yeah, I mean, there's there were times where I sure you made, you know, worked part time and made some money, but yeah, I mean, pretty much I was the sole. Okay. Um, so you just went through that career history. Um, you talked about multiple things that that um, came came to you basically from your proximity to LA. Do you feel like that's still a benefit to you to be in that LA area for to gain that benefit? Yeah, it's a tremendous benefit. Um, you know, I think. I mean, just even reflecting on um, 
you know, an email that was just shared about me saying I don't have a professional future in Leland. Um, what I mean by that is I don't have any tangible professional reason, like I have no tangible pro professional reason to be there. There's, and, and that's not to say I didn't, um, you know, I, I, I did some work with the National Writer Series. I taught at like College for Kids at Northern Michigan College. There's a tech school where I lectured to like a writing studio there. So I did do some stuff in Traverse City, but there was no like meaningful connections and all the connections that, you know, it's, it's, you know, all the connections like Los Angeles, it's just who you who, like just meeting people, you know, like I saw um, in February, I was at a track meet and saw the father of a, you know, a, a child that our kids went to preschool with. And he's a producer. So I am in touch with him. Like I have, you know, I've friends of a friend who's a writer. I went to, a, you know, his book launch and so saw people there that I know I have friends who write for TV shows and write for write books and I have friends from UCLA who have production companies. And so, you know, it's very much a, a, a business of um, whether it's, you know, I've done, I've, again, I've done journalism, I've done nonfiction, I've done fiction, I've pursued screenwriting, but it's very much like a personal connection thing that just kind of happens by being in proximity. And most of the way I, I would say I've built my career in Los Angeles, it was from meeting people through going to events, going to workshops, going to readings, you know, just being physically present and going to those things. And that's how those opportunities have developed. Same thing with um, advertising work, you know, before the, I mean, there's this, a lot's been made of me working remotely, but, um, you know, since the pandemic, you know, most people work remotely. We're all sitting here on Zoom um, in this capacity. So I think the term working remotely is, um, is uh, you know, that, it's it, it's sort of it has different meanings i work for myself and i work sort of out of my house and that's what i've done prior to the pandemic if i had a for the most part if i was working with an advertising agency i was on site and that was also through you know something that i did through connections um so yeah every every, every meaningful professional opportunity that i've ever gotten in my career has been from living in Los Angeles and making personal connections. And that's how I've built the career that I have. Okay. I mean, so when I was doing sports writing, you know, I would go down like the LA Galaxy is here. So I go interview players for the LA Galaxy or international soccer teams would come. So I could go do stories about international soccer teams. I could go interview people from the US soccer team. Like I could go, I pitch stories about people from the Lakers. So I go, you know, meet people from the Lakers, like everybody's here. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, pretty crucial um, and has been, and that's where I built my career. So it's kind of continued to be that way. Okay. And you said in 2010, you had this opportunity where you bounced up your income from 35,000 to 80,000. Um, and that was a big step up. And then from that, then you took a, a, a job with a, um, what was it? An advertising agency that moved you to LA in April yeah. of 2011? What yeah. was that? What what did that income bring you for that move to LA? Uh, one hundred five thousand. Okay. You know, and you know, I, I I will say like part of the reason that I was pursuing the work that I was pursuing in Chicago is because we wanted to move, um, and I knew that I would need a job to do that. So I had a job in a you know a a profession that would allow me to get a job elsewhere. And that's what happened. And we wanted to move out of Chicago when this opportunity came up and that's how we moved our family. So um, what does your income look like these days? Uh, in the past five years, what, what is your average income? Uh, I think the average, you know, kind of it's, it's usually, it's usually up around like, you know, 175, 175,000. Okay. You know, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, part of the reason I will say that, um, you know, I, I do copyright and I do content strategy, but I've somewhat hit sort of a ceiling in what I'm doing. Like I've kind of been making, sometimes I make more, you know, in a given year, but in terms of my hourly rate, it's been the same, I think actually since like 2015, like I've kind of hit a ceiling. And so in order to, you know, grow my income, um, 
you know, it's really necessary for me to get other kinds of work going on, which is a large part of, you know, why I was living here. And, um, you know, I had found a way to do that. Okay. Can you walk us through um, Ishwari's uh, career history since you were married? Yeah, so when we got married, um, she was working in research in Chicago uh, and taking pre-med classes at Loyola University, um, which she continued to do through 2008. She also tried, she started an at-home baking company. Um, you know, and, and I do, I do want to caveat this by saying, um, you know, saying a couple things. One is, um, I've always believed in Aishwarya's abilities and her talents, and I still do. She's an extremely talented interior designer, has always been a very talented sort of artist and creative person. You know, and her motion, there's this line in her motion from November 9th that says our marriage is characterized by, um, it says, I just want to read it. Um, parties, da, 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 just, Marriage has been characterized by plaintiff being unable to control his anger, resulting in horrible, horrible screaming and yelling. I, I still don't really understand what that means. I don't know how marriage is characterized by that in that way. I would characterize our marriage by us being devoted parents to our children. You know, we had two children. We had two kids before we were had been married for two years. We were devoted to them and to their lives, to their educations. We were each supportive of one another's careers. Um, and I was... I sure was supportive of me and I was supportive of her. And a lot of times that meant me committing money to support her. So she started an at-home banking company in 2008. I think we used like $2,000 or so from a college fund that I'd left over to, to start that. That didn't really work out because it just logistically wasn't working. Um, she started working again in research at a hospital in uh, Chicago, and then was working in research at Northwestern, which she did from 2010 to 2011. No, 2009 to 2010. Um, we had two young kids. You know, Leo at that time was a year. Josephine was two and a half. And it just was kind of chaotic. We had babysitters and stuff. And so we decided, my recollection is mutually, um, that she would not work and um, stay home with the kids and, and take classes, uh, pre-med classes, because she's still planning to go to medical school. Uh, she continued to do that through like the end of 2010. I think once she took organic chemistry with two little kids, like it just kind of proved to be too much. Um, 2011, she started pursuing copywriting. And when we moved here, we moved to Los Angeles in April 20, 2011. And in the fall, um, the other thing about Aishwarya is whenever she pursues something, like she tends to get it. So like, I remember she was like, I'm gonna cold call people and she called Children's Hospital Los Angeles and they were like, yeah, we have a job for you. And they hired her and she worked as a writer in the marketing department. We sent our kids to preschool. Um, she did that through the beginning of 2012. She was sort of laid off or fired. I remember it was a really ugly situation that was extremely painful for her. She did sell the story to Ameri uh, Scientific American. Um, she kind of wanted to continue pursuing writing. I remember she took a writing workshop in 2012 um, that I paid for uh, in the fall of 2012. She thought she might want to work and like start a bakery, I think. And she got a job uh, working at sort of a bakery market, sort of this prominent bakery market called Jones on Third in West Hollywood at the place where like Tom Cruise and Reese Witherspoon order their Christmas cakes for people. Um, that didn't go well. Um, again, was let go and that was very painful. She... January and then da, 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 summer of 2013, she started taking art classes. She was interested in art. Um, again, I paid for those. Uh, and then in the fall of 2013, I believe the woman who owned our children's Montessori school was considering selling it. And I swear I put together a business plan to like buy and run the Montessori school, even though she had no training in uh, running a Montessori school. Um, that kind of coincided with a mental health crisis that she had. Um, 
And, you know, to be honest, and I don't need to get into this right now, but, you know, coming out of that mental health crisis, like I knew her family and I knew what had gone on. And I felt that nobody in her family had provided her appropriate support or encouragement. And I decided that I was going to do that. And um, I was going to help her. Like I, I wanted to support her because she was talented and she deserved support. She <clears throat> looked at MFA programs in, in like fine arts and felt like, you know, she, it was a lot of work to get into them. They're expensive. It wasn't a career path. She then looked at two programs, UCLA as an extension school. And she looked at two programs. One was architecture landscaping and one was interior design. We went to open houses for both of them. I know I went to the architectural landscaping one. I don't know if I went to the interior design one. And she decided to pursue that. So she started at the interior design program at UCLA in the fall of 2014. And I paid the tuition for that. She continued, I believe they were night classes. They were night classes. I don't, maybe she had day classes. My memory is they were night classes. She continued that through 2015. Again, she's like, I want to get an internship. She secures an internship with this woman, Windsor Smith, who is like a high-end, very successful interior designer who does work for like Gwyneth Paltrow and Ryan Murphy, who's a big showrunner out here. Um, and I, I sure I had an internship with Windsor Smith. Um, she continued classes at UCLA through the summer. And then I do think I said, like, you know, we kind of, like, we enrolled Josephine in a private school, and I was like, we kind of need you to make money. And she started, she took an internship at Pogan Pole, which is like a high-end kitchen design firm in West Hollywood, um, and was doing really well and liked it. And my recollection is they were basically going to offer her a job. Um, there was another instance where in the fall of 2014, Caltech basically was going to contact her about working as a writer in the alumni affairs department. Um, and pretty much, I think it offered her a job. I remember I was flying back from Michigan. My father was dying of cancer. I'd gone to New York for work. I was flew through Michigan, saw my mom and my dad, and I got back. I was on the bus, and I sure wrote me an email saying, I'm not taking that job and then took like $2,000 out of our savings account to pay her UCLA tuition. Um, the 2015 Pogan poll, I believe was pretty much gonna offer her a job, but she was commuting a lot. Like she was, we'd enrolled, we were living in Los Angeles, we'd rolled Josephine in High Point in Pasadena. And so she would like drive, and I, and I was commuting to El Segundo, which is like an hour and 15 minutes south, and we were like all over the place. And she would drive Leo to school, drive Josephine to school, drive to West Hollywood for work, and it was just a lot. And you know, we decided, or she decided we, that she wasn't going to take the job. She was going to work for herself um, as an interior designer. She got a project with um, a f designing the bathroom of a, for a, a friend of ours in Pasadena. Um, and that kind of how she, was how she started working for herself. My recollection is her goal was to earn $15,000 or basically enough money to send one of our kids to High Point. Um, but she never, she, the, the friend paid her $1,000 for the bathroom and she never earned anything more than that, I don't think. Um, then I started this company coaching soccer, which was a disaster. I sure spoke to that and I can speak to that more as well. And then in the fall of 2016, we were going to be gifted all this money by my mother from my, you know, just to clarify what that was, my father died of cancer in February 2015. He had a bunch of money saved. And he had these two life insurance policies and $2 million life insurance policies in place when he died. He was 65 when he died. And after kind of everything settled down and my brother worked on the estate, it was like my mom was going to have plenty of money to live off of through the end of her life. And she was advised by her attorney and her financial advisor to gift my brother and I $750,000 out of these $2 million life insurance policies that my dad had in place. She gifted us $650,000 in <clears throat> October of 2016. And Aishwarya had been talking about finishing the program at UCLA, which she kind of just spoke to earlier this afternoon. And so I suggested that she use some of the money for some professional pursuit, and I figured it would be the program. Uh, instead, she told me she wanted to open a grocery store. And I was not supportive of that because she never worked in a grocery store or run a grocery store or worked in brick and mortar or anything. She wanted to invest $50,000 in it. Um, she, uh, we fought very, we, we got in a huge fight about it. You know, I'd also like to 
kind of point out, you know, she testified earlier that, that she acquiesced to my anger. Um, that is not true. <clears throat> We've never made a major life, major life to milestone life decision based on pretty much anything I want, where we want to live, where we send our kids to school. Um, I was generally the one who acquiesced to her anger. She threatened to divorce me, and eventually I agreed to, you know, give her $50,000 to open this store. Um, she had a business plan. You know, she was really, she was working hard on it. Part of the calculation, though, was we were in the process of, or I was in the process of buying the house in Pasadena, which was a financial stretch. And I said, if I, we buy the house, I will pay the mortgage, but you need to pay for the kids to go to private school. And we'd organized our life around the kids being in private school. They were at High Point. That's what I sure wanted. She wanted to live in Pasadena. So to kind of like orient our kids' life around this school. And I said, if we buy the house, I need you to pay for school. And she said, okay. So we put $50,000 into the business. I signed on as the guarantor of her lease. It was a $5,000 a month five-year lease. So it was a $300,000 lease. Um, very short. I, I, got, I had a full-time job that I got laid off from. You know, she, Very shortly after she signed that lease, she found out she couldn't open a grocery store because of zoning issues. She decided to open a home decor store <clears throat> that never, you know, it just, the store failed. And so we lost um, the $50,000 that we put into it. And she never paid school tuition. I paid about 19000 So I would say we lost, that loss was about $70,000 in money um, that we never recovered from in Pasadena. <clears throat> she then she closed the store in 2018. And she did do some small projects. Um, you know, she, did, she got projects coming out of that store. Um, but again, I want to point out her motion says she worked part time when we lived in Pasadena. Her combined income from the four years we lived in Pasadena, 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020, was, I believe, negative $45,000. So that's a negative, that's an average of negative $11,000 a year for the four years we lived there. Um, and she, you know, wanted to try and pursue work. She had, we had Birdie. She did some part-time work for an architect, um, but never, you know, got, no, she, she got a, she got a design project with a friend in Pasadena that was going on. Then we moved to Leland. She wasn't working, took art classes. And then she, she, um, worked part-time as a sub at the school. She, at Leland Public School, she um, worked part-time, sort of on a short-term basis at 90 Rose. That's what she was doing when she filed for divorce. And then, yeah, in, in August of 2021, I mean, she wasn't really marketing herself. I mean, everybody, you know, because she had friends and she was in town, it's a small community, everybody knew she was an interior designer. So in August of 2021, our our realtor who'd sold us her home in Leland contacted me and said, we have a client who is going to buy, probably going to buy a house in Leland. They're looking for an interior designer. And can I refer I sure you? And I did pause a few days because she had just filed for divorce. We were fighting horribly and I wasn't feeling tremendously magnanimous, but I said, you know, I, I said, do you want me to refer? I asked her, I said, do you want me to refer you to John? She said, yes. And Obviously, he did, and that became, she got this project in October of 2021, and it turned out that people in the house were like billionaires, and that's what launched her business in Leland, which is what she's been doing since October of 2021. Okay. Um. Okay, and so just, and and to summarize, then you when you were married, you moved to Chicago for what reason, Andrew? Um, because we decided we had decided to have the baby. We decided to get married. My dad did kind of give us this ultimatum, but we decided to get married, and um, you know, we I was living in Carbondale, Illinois, which is not a wonderful place to live and I had a year left in school and so you know it seemed like if one of us was going to make a change that it would be me so I you know I did that 
um, okay. to try and make you know our, our marriage work um, and get a job and provide for my family. Okay. But it, the job that I got was not what I had was that was not the career track that I was on. It was a it was a deviation from that. Um, I don't know exactly where I would have gone if I'd stayed in school. I was going to apply for fellowship programs, um, but I was not going to do what I pursued. Okay. And Ishwari was in Chicago taking pre-med classes at that time. He was in Chicago taking pre-med classes. Okay. Um, when you brought up that you were looking at that, for that first kind of career job opportunity that could take you out of uh, Chicago, you said that they had offices in LA and in Brooklyn. Um, how did you and Ishwari decide on LA? I know you talked about the weather. Was there any reason that Brooklyn was off the table? I mean, my recollection was, you know, I swear I grew up in Connecticut and New York and um, doesn't get along with her family. She doesn't. She has a very contentious relationship with her mother, who at the time was living with her sister. So I swear his aunt in Connecticut. She I swear had another aunt who had been very close to her when she was younger, but came out that she had done some um, when I swear his father died in the fall of 2001 and came out that Aishwarya's aunt had done some shady things with her father's business and to her mother. And so um, in June of 2008, I think she actually wrote to her on her wedding anniversary. I think that was the last time they had contact. And so Aishwarya didn't want to be around her family. She didn't want to be in New York. She didn't want to be around her mother or aunts or her brother was living in New York at the time. She didn't want to be around her family. So we moved to Los Angeles. That was a big factor. Okay. Um, how did you and Ashwarya make the decision to move to uh, Northern Michigan in the summer of 2020? Was that a was that a joint decision? Well, I mean, you know, it, it was. Yeah, you know, I mean, I touched on it. Like, the move to Michigan was related to the move to Pasadena, as I see it. You know, we were living in Los Angeles. We had enrolled our children in a private school in Pasadena that I swear I loved. And it was like she had friends there and we saw a future for the kids there. I didn't actually particularly want to live in Pasadena, but, you know, it was close to the kids' school and she wanted to do it. And so it's like, okay, we were going to be gifted this money. I actually had some serious reservations about being gifted the money, but I felt like, you know, it was in the best interest of our children to buy a home. The plan that we had that we talked about was that we were gonna buy a house and I swear I was gonna decorate it and use the photos for her interior design business. Um, but when we got gifted the money, she decided she wanted to open a grocery store. And so I ended up buying the house on my own. And it was actually one of the major disappointments. I, I, I wanted to buy a house with Aishwarya. I remember in the sort of escrow process, my mortgage broker said, can she get on the loan? Because my credit wasn't great. And I called her and I said, do you want to get on the loan? She said, no, my credit's terrible because I have these loans from student loans in Chicago and my credit's awful, which she'd never told me about before. So I bought the house. <clears throat> my name was on the title and she opened a grocery store. And I, it was really quite painful to me that this thing that I thought we were going to do together never materialized. And it became I, me buying a house that we loved. I remember we walked into the house it's by the Rose Bowl. It's this historic Victorian home. And we all immediately felt like this is our home. And we were able to buy it. Then we got a historical designation on it, which meant that the property taxes were actually 70% of what they should have been. So the home value was over a million dollars, but the property taxes, the assessed property taxes were like 350,000. So we had this huge property tax savings. Our children were thriving at school. Um, I remember like I would take my kids to school every day and I had this tree, my lucky oak tree, and I'd like stand at this oak tree and say a prayer that I was grateful to God for our home and our children's lives. And when I was working, like I was grateful to be, get, be able to give this to our children. But it was difficult. Like it was financially, it was a stretch. I was commuting, you know, for two of the three years like we lived there, I was commuting like, you know, two and a half, three hours a day. I swear he was home alone. She was with three kids. Like it was a lot. And, you know, we shared sort of this vision, you know, this kind of dream of Northern Michigan. You know, we started going, I went to Northern Michigan my whole life. My great grandparents built a cottage on Lake Bel Air. And, um, 
And I, my dad grew up going there. I grew up going there. I swear the first time she went was in 2004 and we just like fell in love with Northern Michigan. And then my parents bought a house on Old Mission and they, in a subdivision, based Villa subdivision. And we got to be friends with people um, in that subdivision. And like when I was growing up, it was just like, you know, I don't know, like everybody's here lives in Northern Michigan. But like for me coming downstate, like it was just like, it, it never made, I was like, I don't know if we can live up there. But we met people and were like, oh, this is what your life looks like. We had good friends. And so it became appealing to us. Um, what happened was, and I'm just going to go through the details. It was September of 2019. Um, and we were in the middle of a horrendous conflict with my family. September of 2019, Aishwarya came to me one day. I was working at home. And she said, I think we should move to Ann Arbor. And I was like, okay. And so we started talking about moving to Ann Arbor. We met with a realtor um, to get a sense of the sale price of our home, to get a sense of the potential profit we could make. Um, and I started tracking like what that profit would be um, minus debts. We had about $40,000 in debts. Um, and so we talked about Ann Arbor and then kind of decided, no, we shouldn't do Ann Arbor because my mom is there. And we have this conflict with my mom. We looked at Gross Point. Then we kind of set it aside. <clears throat> and then in January of 2020, we decided to move to Northern Michigan. And, um, but, you know, the big concern that we always had jointly was education because we had centered our children's lives around education in Los Angeles, always had. And we were concerned that, the, that we wouldn't be able to get a similar education in Northern Michigan. Um, I also had very, very serious concerns about this conflict going out with my family. My mom was in Traverse City. It was with my mother, my brother, and my aunt, primarily. My aunt owned my grandparents' uh, cottage in Bel Air. My mom was in Traverse City. And I just, I said to her one day, I feel like I'm walking into an emotional buzzsaw if I move to Traverse City. Um, and, but we pursued it. And then I will say that when the pandemic started, you know, that was, I, I, I would say, I can say with probably like 90% certainty, I don't think we would have moved if COVID hadn't happened because, you know, the economy imploded. And frankly, we were worried that we were going to lose our house. And like the money in the house was like my dead father's life insurance money. And it was like, well, we can either stay here and, you know, we don't know what's going to happen with the economy or sell our house and have basically $500,000 and, you know, an, an opportunity to have security. Um, we applied for the kids to get in the, to go to Pathfinder. They got in the Pathfinder. Um, then I swear I saw this house on Zillow and I contacted a real John Watkins, a realtor I'd been in touch with and we scheduled a zoom tour. And it was this house like 3,500 square foot kind of ramshackle estate on like, you know, it was originally listed on 17 acres and then they cut it down to 10 acres of land. Um, I remember that weekend, and I was like, my financial plan with moving to Michigan, particularly when we're talking about it in the fall, was like, okay, we're going to have somewhere around four hundred fifty, five hundred thousand dollars. I wanted to buy a house. We looked at houses in Ann Arbor for like four fifty. I wanted to put like two hundred thousand dollars into a house, have a mortgage of less than two thousand dollars, have another two hundred thousand dollars like saved that we could put toward the children's college education or um, buy a property in Northern Michigan. I did want to focus on writing. So we see this house, it's $450,000 in Lake Leelanau. And I remember the weekend before, we scheduled a Zoom tour the weekend before, I said to Ashwari, like, I don't, you know, we're living in all this financial stress right now. I don't want to go back into that. You sure you want to do this? And she's like, no, 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 let's look at it. So I, <laughs> then we did the Zoom tour and we got on, and, and I was just not, I, I, was, I was not interested. Like it was, just, it was a huge fixer upper and we sat down afterwards and I swear you said, well, you know, we put all our money into this house here and it was protected. And if we put our money into the house there, um, then it would be, protect, be protected then. And I said, I don't want to spend the next two years remodeling a house. I said, I want to focus on writing. And she said to me, I don't want to hear about your writing anymore. And um, we put in an offer. I flew to see the house. This was the weekend after Memorial Day. So middle of COVID, it was the weekend, the first weekend. I don't know if you remember the George Floyd, George Floyd protests were going on everywhere. Like it was chaos. When I flew 
I got like the last ticket I could get before they before you could fly in July. I flew. I had like glasses and rubber gloves and a mask. I mean, it was there was nobody at the airport. It was crazy. So anyway, we go there. We go to Leland. I go to Leland. I see the house. I keep an open mind. The sellers. We kind of. It was kind of assumed that this was all a deal. Like we put in an offer. They were okay with it. While I was there, the sellers backed out. Or they no, they they I can't remember what they said. Or they weren't gonna we we asked for all the property. They said they weren't gonna all 17 acres. They said they weren't gonna do it. And then it came out that they were trying to screw us out of the earnest money. Um there was like a bunch of shady stuff going on. And I remember flying out of Traverse Traverse City and felt like I was like leaving Funny Farm. Like I was like such a banana situation. I got home and I said, um, you know, we pulled the offer. And, you know, I swear I said, I can't stop thinking about the house. And she called John Watkins and she said, can we put another offer? And I said, fine. Yeah, I said, okay. Our house was you know, in escrow and it was like a Sunday afternoon and our everything got finalized with our house. We were, we were set to make like 520 or $523,000. And like within an hour, within an hour, it was like, they accepted our offer for the house on Lake Leland off and everything went through with our house in Pasadena. Um, and then we went into escrow, which was a nightmare with the sellers and like, you know, inspections. And it was just kind of like, okay, okay, okay. Um, and we were driving to the bank to wire the money to pay cash. I got it. When we sold our house here, I had a check in my hand, in my name on June 18th of 2020 for $523,000. I took it to City National Bank and I opened the bank account that has been discussed today. And, you know, a few weeks later, we were driving to the bank to wire the money to buy the house. And I said, Daishwarya, I don't feel good about this. So this is the fourth time I've said, I don't feel good about this house. And she said, no, 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 we're going to own a house in Northern Michigan. Um, and we bought the house. And <clears throat> I remember... I don't want to get into too many details, but I remember the day we were leaving Pasadena, my attorney, we were doing this whole like pro, like land survey thing. And my realist, realtor sent us a, a land, a, a survey. And there was a, a triangle in the land survey. And it said, John and, John and I to be Stanton Headstone. And I texted my realtor and he said, and I said, are there bodies buried on this property? And he said, yes, finding out more. That is how this began. We got on a plane that night. We took a red eye. <clears throat> we got to Traverse City. I would say from the moment, for me, we got in the car at the airport at Traverse City. I knew we'd made a mistake. We got to the property. I knew we made a mistake. Generally, I sure and I had been in agreement that moving from Pasadena was a mistake. Um, it was total chaos in the house. It was just, it was gross. It was disgusting. I spent days on my hands and knees cleaning it. You know, we couldn't get our stuff moved in. Like, it was awful. I sure you wanted to demo the kitchen because she couldn't even stand being in it. She never saw the house. She bought it sight unseen. Um, the whole financial plan that I had of $200,000 into a $450,000, $500,000 house, paying, I wanted to pay off our debts. We didn't pay off our debts. I wanted to buy a car, a new car for cash, you know, like $30,000. That didn't happen. And it was just chaos. And I remember it was like August of 2020, so it was four or six weeks after we moved there. And it was a Saturday, and Aishwarya basically said she didn't want to be married to me anymore. And uh, that's how moving to northern Michigan transpired and began. Okay. Um, when you say the Lake Lila home was unlivable, did did you meet with someone to find out about what would be needed to be done to to make it up to your standards? So, I mean, the other thing I want to say is like I talked about when we were I, I mentioned North Carolina. I was always interested in moving to North Carolina. She so didn't want to do that. I think the reason that we came to an agreement is it like seemed like I wanted to send the kids to public school. I had been I had wanted to move to Michigan for years, like move out of Los Angeles, you know, I mean, I was kind of indecisive, but like, it was like, if this is what we can agree on, this is what we're going to do. There was this idea that like, oh, we won't have a mortgage and you can focus on writing and blah, you know, and, and that was an idea, but pretty much upon arriving in the house, we knew we couldn't live in it. Um, I mean, we had inspections, you know, but as far as, so once we did the demo, like it became very clear that we needed to take out, like we needed to remodel the house. It had, there was an original house, 
that had been modified and the addition was just terrible. Like it was gross. There was, you know, and, and the, the demo was the walls were pulled out of the kitchen. You know, I swear you wanted, we just said, I swear it's like, we hooked up a stove, we put in a laundry tub for a sink, they tore open the roof because the chimney was leaking. It was a disaster. They demoed, you know, the, the guest house, they demoed two bath, three bathrooms. Um, and so we met with several architects, two we didn't like, and then we met with this guy, Peter Smith, for, who was actually from Ann Arbor, who was with Design Smith. And, you know, again, like going back to Pasadena, so we bought the house, it was like a million, one million, twenty-five thousand dollars. I think we put down three hundred fifty thousand dollars, and my mortgage was six hundred fifty thousand dollars. And I had an FHA loan and it was like forty three hundred dollars a month. And so I didn't want to have a mortgage of six hundred thousand dollars plus again. That was the whole reason I moved. So we put $450,000 cash into the house. We meet with Peter Smith and we liked him and he had a vision for the property. And he's like, you know, this is a million dollar property and here's my vision for the, the, the um, remodel. And, I, and we said, well, how much would that be? And he's like six to $700,000. That was in like early October. So again, you know, I had this whole, like we talked about our financial life improving, but within, you know, three months it was, basically going to be back the same. And I, I didn't like the house. I never felt good about moving to Leland. I didn't think it was right for our kids. And so I had, I was not motivated to, um, you know, take out, the, the, get a six to a 600 to $700,000 remodel on the house. Um, but we hired them. They were, uh, they were doing designs. It was supposed to take six to eight weeks. Um, you know, I, I will say also, like, I was freelancing, and then this company that I, um, they offered me a full-time job that I wasn't really interested in taking. Um, it was it was less money than I would have made freelancing, and I had to decide about taking it. And I remember it was like a Monday, and Ashwari and I had talked about it, and she was tired of hearing about my work, which I understand. And I remember thinking if... The spring comes and we need to get a mortgage or get this construction loan and I can't do it because I don't have a full-time job or there's an issue with my income. I sure he's going to be furious with me. And so I took this full-time job because I was afraid of her getting angry at me, not being able to get a loan to remodel the house. Um, we, and you know, they were supposed to take six to eight weeks, which would have been by the end of 2021. They didn't finish till March, you know. I, it was $12,000, my income paid for 8,000 of it. And by the time we got the designs, like our marriage was not going well. I was, you know, having a difficult time. I didn't want to live in Leland. I didn't really want to be in the house, uh, live in the house. Um, we got bids on the work and it was a million dollars. Um, and people were like, my therapist, we had friends who said, don't, you got your marriage is not in a place to remodel a house. Don't do it. So we denied, decided not to, and then we were going to tear the house down. We made this plan to tear the house down, and, you know, that's just, and then we obviously didn't tear the house down. Okay. Um, did you share with Ashwarya that you were unhappy in Leland? Yeah. <laughs> I mean. um, did, did Ashwarya acknowledge that you were unhappy in Leland? Did, Ash, did Ashwarya acknowledge yeah. you? Yeah, I mean, we, you know, like, <clears throat> we fought a lot, you know, and, and I've apologized, like, I, I, I have said, I have no, you know, we read, read through the emails, like, my emotions that year were out, were, were out of control, like, but I also say, I think anybody going through what I went through, like, I had gone from, our life in Pasadena was expensive, the kids were doing amazing, I go through pictures on my phone, and the kids are like, glowing smiles. Our children were happy, thriving children in Pasadena. And, you know, I was like, okay, we're going to sell the house, but it's like, let's have this plan. The plan wasn't carried out. Like we, like nothing that I had envisioned was happening. And now we're living in this house that is like driving me crazy because it's un, just like unlivable. I swear he doesn't want to be married to me. We're fighting all the time. My family of origin basically, like, kind of completely rejected me. Um, I'm struggling with my career. I'm, like, feeling totally isolated. 
And yeah, so I, it, I made it very clear. And one of the things I didn't understand was we'd had this life in Pasadena and it was working. And then all of a sudden we're in Leland. And it's like, it didn't make any sense to me. I didn't understand, like the education wasn't good. Like the house was a disaster. Like, and I sure I was like, kind of like, this is what I want to do. Although we fought, but there were times where she said she wanted to move back to Los Angeles. Like, I remember like we got these baby chickens and they die, like they died within hours of getting there. And then I think the next day she hit a, a, like a squirrel in the road and she texted me and was like, I want to move back to Los Angeles. Um, so no, we, I, I made it clear. And, you know, as our marriage wasn't going well, like we talked about me in the spring of 2021 going to, going to LA to kind of get a break. I didn't do that. And then I remember we took a family trip to North Carolina, which I, I loved being in Winston-Salem. We, I, we went to New York. I took her to New York for our anniversary. I surprised her with a trip to New York. Um, Operation Rekindle, as I still call it, didn't work out so well. Um, but I remember <clears throat> it was June 28th. It was my dad's birthday, and I was teaching a class, this College for Kids class at Northern Michigan Community College. And I was driving down there, and I remembered it was my dad's birthday. And he's buried on Old Mission Peninsula, Peninsula Township Cemetery, out near uh, Mia Tawanto. Is that how you pronounce it? Is that right? Yeah. Right, pronounce it right? Yeah. Um, and, I, and I was like, I need to go to his grave. And so I'm driving on Old Mission where my mom lives. And it was just this, you know, I was like, it was traumatizing and upsetting. And I go to his grave and I'm literally standing at my father's grave, afraid that my mother's going to show up because I cut off contact with her five months earlier. And I didn't tell Aishwarya because she said, stop talking about your family so much. I came home. I told her that afternoon. And I remember the next day, it was June 29th. She said, you can't live here. You can't live in Leland. Um, so she was very clear that I was really struggling. And she did say that I could not live there. Yeah. Okay. And, and there was reference made to um, the two of you, two of you agreeing to have a kind of a separation period in, in July of 2021. Yes. Um, how did you handle that separation? Where did you go? Did you leave the home? Where, where did you go? Who went with you? So we, um, things were going very badly. Um, you know, I was, a, I was really upset and it was right. It might've been that day, June 29th. She, we had talked about me going to LA and it was, she was like, I think you should go to Los Angeles to like go there, see if you want to live there, get a break. I'd actually mentioned to her, like maybe I should rent an apartment in Los Angeles for the next year and fly back and forth to like, and that really upset her. Cause she was like, why, why you like, she felt like I was abandoning my family. And I was like, okay. Um, and she contacted our friends, the year checks who are like our oldest friends here in Los Angeles. They were our first neighbors. And every year they go to Vermont usually, and Molly Yurchak said they're going to Vermont for three weeks and they have chickens and bunnies and dogs and cats and this sort of urban farm and they needed somebody to house it. And they said I could stay there for three and a half weeks. Um, so I was leaving on July 19th, um, early, mid July, you know, things were going very badly between us. I think it was July 15th. I swear you, we would, would drive around and talk and I swear you kind of expressed a lot of pain to me. And she said, I want to separate. And we agreed for like a one year separation starting on July 15th. I flew, um, we went out to dinner the next day. There was a whole incident with the bunny and the arguing. I flew to Pasadena on July 19th. And because, and I was planning to be there through like August probably 9th. And I think because we were considering moving back to Pasadena, we had Josephine and Leo fly out to spend a week with me. So they came to kind of see if they not, we didn't talk to them, but just to sort of have them there and gauge their feelings. And so they flew out on July 29th. And so that's where we were. Yeah. Okay. And then, then the infamous August 1st thing happened. What was it on August 1st? Yeah. August 1st, 2021. And that's when you got the email from Ishwarya. And that's previously been entered, um, but it's where she acknowledges to you that she wants a divorce. Yes, she said she filed for divorce on legal zoom. And she yeah. had filed for divorce. Okay. Um, and at the, that time, what was your first thought when you got that email? I was in complete shock. Okay. I was at 
Um, John Muir High School is a Sunday morning with Josephine and Leo. It's the high school in our old neighborhood. We were running at the track. I got a text from her and she said, I sent an email, you need to read this in private. I just warmed up and I went and I stood under the bleachers and I read that email and I was in complete shock. And I didn't say anything to my kids and I just ran a mile around the track. Um, I was in total shock. And, that, and then what happened? I mean, what, what, was, what was the response? How did you react to that? <clears throat> What we we agree. So we said, I said, let's talk on the phone today. So we talked on the phone that afternoon. The kids were at friend, a friend's house. And I said, okay, how, like, how are you planning to pay for this? She said, I don't know. I said, well, do you have plans about where we're going to live or what we're going to do about the house? And she said, I hadn't really thought about that. And then she told me that she'd wanted to kill herself every day for the past year. And she told me that she had been thinking about drowning herself in Lake Leelanau, but it was too cold. It would be too cold. And she didn't want to do that to our children. Um, that was very alarming to me because she'd had a suicidal, very serious suicidal episode in 2013. The following day, she, and we kind of calmed down. We, we talked through it, you know, and we texted later that day. And the next day she texted me sent me a text saying she had a friend take my shotgun that she bought me for my 40th birthday out of her house because she wanted to shoot my mother for her birthday, which was on August 4th. Um, so I was very alarmed by the divorce filing, by her saying she wanted to kill herself, by her saying she wanted to kill my mother. Um, and I contacted, I spoke to my therapist and he said, you need to get an attorney. Contacted uh, friends friend's friend, sister-in-law who referred me to Melissa Umelis. She had also said she wanted to mediate it with a firm in Ann Arbor. So the day after she filed, um, I contacted this firm in Ann Arbor and they're like, we can't help you with a divorce from Washtenaw County. You need somebody in Northern Michigan. Said, okay. Contacted Melissa Umelis and we spoke on Thursday, August 5th. And, and pr prior to that, I said, I'm really worried about her mental health. Um, I'm, I, for the reasons I just said, and I said she had this, she's been hospitalized twice for mental health. Um, we get on the phone and Melissa says, I don't see a divorce filing. And I said, okay. And said, well, she has this receipt from LegalZoom. So I forwarded that email and Melissa read it. And she said, does this read like a suicide note to you? And I said, you know, I don't necessarily read it that way, but I can see how it can be interpreted that way. And she said, where are your kids? And I said, Josie and Leo are here with me and Bertie's in Michigan with you. I swear to God. She said, you need to get home as soon as you possibly can. And she said, if you don't go home immediately, a judge would look very poorly on you. You need to get home as soon as you possibly can. You need to arrange for lodging and get all of the children out of the house in your care. And you need to tell her to go seek mental health treatment in an emergency facility. She also said, you can also file for an emergency custody order. Act as to hearsay. Whatever attorney Umulus told him, which is also a violation of his attorney client privilege. I don't know if he intends to waive it, but it's certainly hearsay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, you know, just tell Andrew, just tell us your response to that. What so do you anyways, I, and then we'll end and then we'll end there. Okay. So <laughs> I, um, I spoke to an attorney. And I reserved uh, an Airbnb. I got a hotel room and I changed my flights. I had to leave, you know, like four days early. I had to contact Molly, find somebody else to watch the house. I changed my flights to leave with the kids. I got a hotel room in Traverse City. I got an Airbnb in Bel Air. Um, we missed our flight on that Saturday morning. And so I couldn't stay with the kids in a tra hotel in Traverse City Saturday night. So I sure picked us up and we stayed in the house. And the next day, we talked about her divorce. She said, I want you to pay for it. We went and looked at a rental home for me that I wasn't ready to move into because of the state of our home and I sure his mental health. I said, what do you want to do about the house, our house that we own? And she said to me that she felt that the house belonged to her because she had thrown parties there and made an effort to make relationships. I said, what about moving out of Leland? And she said, I'm not moving. And then I said, you know, I'd like you to go in an emergency room and she refused. And then I took, you know, loaded the kids in my car and put my boat on the car and drove to Bel Air to take them. And they, and I stayed in Bel Air with them for four nights. 
and that's the do first you know two if, part. Do you know if Vishwarya went to the hospital? She did not go to the hospital. Did get assessed? Okay. Um, I think, Your Honor, I think that's probably a good place to stop. Um, sure. And um, we did discuss off the record that um, it seems likely that we're going to, we have another day. This is day three of four scheduled, um, but the way it's worked out, it's likely we're going to need at least another day. So I will speak with the person who does my scheduling and um, at least get one ready. Yeah, uh, that would be us. great. That it, rather than waiting till the 22nd to then request, I'll, I'll take care of that um, well, today. <laughs> uh, so have a nice weekend. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you.